So 20 minutes flies by super fast. And because it does, I would like, with, without further ado, to call to stage Andrew Salzberg, who is Uber's head of transport policy and research. Hi. So I was reading your biography the other day, and I don't want to make you blush, but I kept thinking that I think you know you and I would make a really good onstage match. So before joining the global policy team, you were a senior operations manager for New York City, Uber's largest market, where I happened to be when I got the invitation to be on stage and interview you. Um, prior to joining Uber, you worked at the World Bank on public transportation investments in Asia, where I'm from. But as it so happens, 5 by 5 has also designed open innovation programs for the World Bank. You hold a master's in urban planning from Harvard and a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from McGill. And you know what? I went to McGill for grad school. And I think it was at exactly the same time that you were there. I had no idea right now. <laughs> Um, your focus is on making Uber an integral part of the future of urban transportation through research, partnerships, and policy development. And, uh, you know, at 5 by 5 we design and operate the innovation studio for mobility of Ile de France, Greater Paris. But I think the thing that we share the most, and not so coincidentally, because it's probably why, you know, we share, put us up here in the first place, is the sincere belief that data sharing can and should play a role in drastically improving urban mobility. You're going to that one. Yes. Should I, should I go with that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. I think it's something we get asked about almost everywhere we operate is, you know, how can the data that Uber has in its system be helpful to people outside of Uber? And it's been a hard question for us because I think a lot of the data that we have uh, on the operations in cities is incredibly interesting to our competitors, right? We're not in a market like we were five years ago where if you were a taxi operator in New York, you had a garage. Your drivers went out, they found their own fares, and there was no real benefit to individual operators to having more data. But now if you look in New York, you know, there's five different companies that are in the same marketplace as Uber. And so sharing data can be incredibly interesting to our competitors as somewhere that they can target incentives um, and think about sort of competing with us. So that's one angle we have to think about. And the other, obviously, is individual rider privacy. So those are the constraints. But I think even knowing those constraints, there's lots of places that we can potentially share data that can be useful to outside parties. So the starting point for that was, was Uber Movement, which we launched in January of this year. If you haven't seen it, movement.uber.com. It was our first step towards this idea of can we make data freely available, and not just to government agencies, but to the public at large, to potentially help in this future of mobility. And so what that data is right now is travel times hour by hour across four cities around the world, Manila, Sydney, Boston, and DC. And, and that's a way to share data that's useful public and free, but it's just a starting point for all the different applications we can find. Okay, um, thanks. So, you know, um, I've, I've done some work on opening data as well in the past, and something that I've learned is that when it comes to opening data, there is a fine line, a uh, fine balance between supplying enough data so developers can actually do something meaningful, and at the same time, too much data causes citizens to worry. How do you, how do you handle that, that divide? Yeah, I think the key for us, and we've, again, we've only had this, this one core data set, but the way we did that was designed for a very specific use case that we know, certainly in the US, every major metropolitan area has a body that's charged with thinking about the 20 or 30 year time horizon for transportation, and they do that with big elaborate transportation demand models that happily I don't have to work with because they're very complicated. But you know, it's, it's very hard to make those decisions but a lot of cities are working without even basic data today on how long it takes to get between different locations in the city. So what's the time in the morning rush hour from downtown to the suburbs? A lot of people don't have that data or they have data that's three or four years old that they paid tens of thousands of dollars for. So when we designed movement, we designed it specifically with long range transportation planners in mind. So everything from the geographic aggregation of the data to the format was designed for that purpose. And so we had this one core use case that was super clear, but once you open that up, we found other examples of people using it to measure changes in infrastructure in a city and what the impact is when, for instance, the metro shuts down. What does that do to travel times? So we had this one core use case that we thought we knew we were building for, but as a result of making it open, we've seen lots of other people, academics, you know, amateur, sort of hobbyists on the weekend using the data for all kinds of things we never intended because it's free and the barrier to using it is pretty low. Has a, has a city ever requested data that you have that we're not willing to share? And if so, what, what data and why? Yeah, I think, you know, all the time. 
I think the reality is, you know, I think one thing we get is people ask for the data as though it's a singular thing. And I think a lot of what people think about is they want individual trip transactions for, you know, you travel from here to the airport to get out of here or, you know, wherever you're going next, because that's the most sort of concrete thing for people who haven't seen um, or had access to our data sort of think about as trip data. And, you know, there's lots of implications for individual rider privacy, for competition from that data set. So that often gets to places that are, you know, it's difficult for us to share that data. But I think when we start to think about the different applications uh, for data that go beyond that, there's lots more space for kind of joint wins. And the, the travel times is one, but, you know, we were just talking at lunch about what about the potential for Uber to share data on, uh, you know, the need for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, right? So there's lots of applications that are not what you'd think of when you first think about data from Uber. But, you know, different slices, different insights that you can get from our operation. You know, we're never going to be the charging infrastructure operator, but we may have a way to share data that can be incredibly valuable to people who are planning that sort of investment. Same with, same with broader infrastructure, roadway maintenance, right? Our drivers could be great, you know, data collectors for road quality through vibrations picked up in the, in the app. So I think, you know, we often get asked for things that it's difficult for us to share, but I think part of that is us doing a better job of explaining what the potential is for different data sets that are kind of non-traditional that might be hugely valuable. So, so speaking of your partners, so your, your website uh, features testimonials, like the one of Washington, D.C.'s mayor, um, Muriel Bowser, and she said something really nice. You know, she said, we're excited to be one of the early partners with Uber in this new platform. We want to employ as many data sources as possible to mitigate traffic congestion, improve infrastructure, and make our streets safer. But then I also found that there were other testimonials out there, like those of Pittsburgh's mayor, Bill Peduto, that aren't quite as kind. Uh, the mayor said Uber wanted to use our public right of ways and didn't want to be engaged with the city when it needed something. So going forward, what do you think, what do you think are the key factors to, to, to success in a strong partnership between you and a city? Yeah, I mean, the most basic thing is that, you know, we have worked with D.C. to have their data available through movement, and we haven't got there yet with Pittsburgh. So part of that is me just spending my time yelling at our product team internally to, to move faster, to get more cities added to the platform. They love to hear from me. Um, all I do is sort of ask them to go faster and not being a product person myself. You know, that's, that's a conversation we have to have in terms of timelines. You know, right now we have four cities available through movement. Um, Pittsburgh's not one of them. Obviously, it's a top priority to get the data um, shared there, and as well as the other you know, 400 markets, depending how you count. We'd love to have... Once, the nice thing about Uber is where you can scale something, right? In theory, once we've figured out how to share travel time data um, in one market, we could do it you know, pretty much in every market around the world as long as we can scale the infrastructure and make that accessible. So I think the short answer is, you know, we want to sit down, we had a chance to sit down with the District Department of Transportation in D.C. and kind of understand what it is they're trying to do and how we might be able to help. You know, one way to do that is data, but there's lots of other cities where we've partnered on public transport operations or, you know, working with hospitals to get patients to and from uh, their appointments or working to get people to and from jobs. So I think in the case of Pittsburgh, it's a question of, you know, how do we sit down and engage on a topic that's defined as a priority by the city and then see what tools we have available. And so I think that will happen. Uh, it may not have happened fast enough, but that's always the dream is to get there in a place that we can collaborate with the city. Just, so that tends to be a little tough sometimes, right? So I'd like, as a city, you know, let's say we're talking about Paris, which is a, a city a lot of us know and love. What can, what can a city expect from Uber during a partnership like this? And, and what shouldn't they be expecting at all? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, it's still early days. So I think there's a lot of scope to define what a partnership with Uber should mean. And I think part of that is thinking about what is the goal for a city like Paris or like Pittsburgh in the long run. Um, I think one place I like to go for the sort of model of what the future could look like, there's a great uh, transport modeling work done by the International Transport Forum. They're based right here in Paris. They did a model of Lisbon and Portugal and said, you know, what's, what's the end goal of transportation in the city? And for them, they modeled out what the implications would be if every single car in the city was shared, every single vehicle in the city was shared. So there's no more cars that were just driven by people, but everyone was available uh, for sharing. And what they found in that scenario was that you could have cut down the number of vehicles required by 97%. So you could have this much smaller footprint of vehicles, which means much less need for parking, much more efficient use of space, you know, cheaper transportation for people. Um, so you could use the roadways as a shared service as part of the broader public transportation network. So, you know, working backwards from that goal, how could we partner with a city like Lisbon or like Paris to work there? I think there's lots of things, right? Data's one, but the other one is, you know, how do we encourage more people to share a ride, uh, whether it's through something like Uber Pool or more traditional carpooling? How do we think about using curb space to reward people who are using cars 
uh, more efficiently? How can we try and get around you know, the need for increased parking and bring cut, cut down costs in some of those environments? So I can think of you know, 10 different ways that you might want to work together on getting to a vision at the end of the day where using space more efficiently or delivering more service uh, more cost effectively. So what we're trying to do is to put people in our markets around the world who have experience partnering with cities to kind of sit down and design a program of how we can collaborate once we're already operating. So, I mean, since we're talking about like broader transportation um, policy, if you could decide, or if you could create, if Uber could create yep. a new city uh, from scratch and design it, um, design the entire transport system exactly how you wanted, and let's say the city was called, I don't know, Uberville and it was on Mars or something like that, so, you know, we take out all yep. the politics there. How, how, do you, how do you go about it, you think? Like, what, what are the key sort of principles? I mean, first of all, we have no plans to design any city, so I don't want to get any uh, headlines out of this. I was looking forward to starting some rumors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, look, right now, if you look in a place like, like most cities that we're operating in nationally in the U.S., our share is like less than 1%, right? So we're a very small share of overall transportation in the city. And I think, you know, shared modes like Uber will hopefully grow to a bigger piece. Um, but, I, you know, I think the goal in a place like Paris or in some city we're starting from scratch let's see how we design, I mean, I think I think about a lot of climate change, right? So it's obviously on everyone's mind. Um, you know, the city of Paris, obviously closely associated with a kind of global commitment to thinking about lowering emissions. So, you know, that obviously would be one of the frames I think you'd want to work to. And so how do you make something, a city that works uh, for people to get around in a way that's convenient and compelling, but also drives the overall carbon impact of transportation down? Um, so I think that obviously part of that is going to be the same kind of investment you already have here in, in public transportation, which is going to be you know, the most efficient mode for, for getting people from A to B primarily. But, you know, like the model of Lisbon I talked about earlier, there's lots of places where, you know, shared cars can be an important aspect of that. So if you're starting from scratch, I think one thing, the most obvious thing I would think about changing from the way cities look, especially in the U.S., is that the amount of parking and road space is enormous. Right? That's less the case in the core of Paris, but even in the suburbs here um, or elsewhere, it's just an enormous amount of space dedicated to car infrastructure. And I think if you could cut that down tremendously by using whatever space you have left for cars more effectively, right? If you got four people into a car instead of one, that means you, not, you need a lot less cars, you need a lot less parking. Um, and so I think you know, changing the frame we have now, which is cars get priority uh, in terms of space to people getting priority and then working out from that, I think you get a lot of interesting places that would look different than the traditional American city. For yeah, that's, a, that, that's a strong vision. Um, and what I'm wondering also is how critical do you think Uber success is as a company to the future of healthy cities and transport, considering what a big player you are today? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, autonomous vehicles, everyone wants to talk about autonomous vehicles, right? It's like a very, if you go to any transportation conference, which I do a lot, it's the topic that everyone wants to talk about. You know, I think if you're thinking about the future and what Uber, what the role Uber has to play is, to me, what I'm most excited about being someone who came from a public transportation background is how do you make sharing a car more compelling than owning a car? Right, right now, most people who use a car own it. You own your own car, you hop into it, um, you drive it where you're going. If we have a future of autonomous vehicles that get adopted in the same way, so everyone owns their own autonomous vehicle, I think there's a lot of potentially negative consequences for cities, right? Empty miles that are driven, um, just like no decrease in the number of vehicles, you know, enormous amounts of parking still required. So for me, Uber, the key role that we play right now for setting the table for the future is making sharing more compelling than owning, which we're starting to do, but in most places we're a pretty small share of overall travel. So how do you make that experience so compelling that people think about giving up their car and by the time autonomous vehicles come around, they're deployed through shared networks and you can hop in the back of any car rather than being attached to your own car? I think that to me is the most important thing we can do I feel like you, you've definitely started that work already. I mean, Uber offers uh, shared rides for as little as $1 in some places. Uh, you've introduced optimized pickup points that algorithmically recreate bus stops. And, you're, you know, and you talked about testing semi-autonomous vehicles. So let's forget about the cabs for a second. Is Uber going to disrupt the bus? So I think if you look, I, I spent a lot of time in the U.S., so I always use my examples there. But if you think about the U.S., if you look at the overall transportation pie, Right now, today, Uber is like half a percent or less. Public transportation as a whole in U.S. travel is like 1.5 percent. And private car travel is like 84 percent. Now, it's obviously, that's very different in a place like New York or Paris where it's a much higher share public transport. But broadly, the vast majority of travel today is not done through shared modes. Right? So I think there's enormous room for both Uber and public transport to grow together by encouraging more people to leave their car at home. So this is certainly most true in the suburbs where can an Uber trip from your door to a rail station make both Uber and public transport more compelling than driving your own car and drive up ridership for both? I think there's a chance to do 
a lot of that work because there's so much space to grow the market for sharing a ride, booking a ride, transportation as a service that I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of collaboration more than there is competition if you just look at the relative size of how much private cars move versus public transport. So we have a lot of places we're partnering with transit in the U.S. and around the world to try and build something collaborative rather than sort of competing on the space. Okay, so I'm looking at the timer and I think we're down to last few seconds. I'm going to end with a closing question. Um, you know, everyone in the room knows that Uber is going through some pretty turbulent changes right now. Yep. And uh, what I was wondering is, as, as an urban policy planner, um, as, a, as an advocate of a, a multimodal transport, what would you, if, and if you were looking for the next CEO of Uber, what qualities and experience would you select for? Yeah, so I am not on the executive search committee, so it's not my direct responsibility to find, but it's the kind of thing we're thinking about, right? And the, the team that I sit on, you know, we, we are this public policy function that thinks about uh, you know, the entire world that Uber operates in and, and trying to take this longer term view, right? All the talks about cities and how we use curb space and how cities can get rid of parking and how we can partner with transport agencies, these are all longer payback things, right? They're not necessarily the next six months, they're years on the road. And so I think, you know, one thing that my team has been been working on, I think we want to um, get more and more interest in across the company is this longer term view, right? I think a lot of, we've only been around for seven years, depending how you count, most markets only occurs. So there's a strong sort of focus on the short term. And I think, you know, one thing that people who care about transportation planning and infrastructure that have lives of decades, I think what I would love to see uh, as we start off on the sort of new direction that we're going to pick up is this longer time horizon thinking, right? What does it mean? What do we think about Uber in five or 10 years? 15 years, how do we build a company that's going to be relevant and meaningful in those places? And I think a lot of that has to go into the kinds of partnerships with people who are in transportation for the long haul, city governments, transport operators around the world. So I'm a little biased, right? Those are things that I think about, but if I was looking for somebody new, someone who has experience in those fields or has, has been in sort of a longer term operating place um, would be helpful, I think, as we, we move forward. Okay. Thank you very much. And that is the end of our panel. Oh, thank you.